Livingston appealed to the crusading spirit that thrived in Victoria's Britain, a spirit that was embodied in the new Houses of Parliament in the heart of the British capital. Prince Albert had spent the last 10 years of his life supervising the decoration of what he saw as a temple to civilized values, good government, law, and the Christian religion. At the heart of the building was the robing room, where the queen would don the robes of sovereignty for the state opening of parliament. Here, in all its glory, was Prince Albert's vision of Camelot. The paintings he commissioned would be a permanent reminder of the legend of King Arthur. These heroic figures were to be role models for soldiers and scientists, the explorers and missionaries who had spread British values around the globe. But how to spread this vision? remained a hotly contested question. In the House of Commons, this question was fiercely debated by Parliament's elected members led by two men whose views of Victoria's empire were diametrically opposed. On the one hand, the conservative Benjamin Disraeli, a passionate advocate of imperial power and glory. And on the other, his lifelong adversary, the liberal William Gladstone, who championed the moral vision of Prince Albert and David Livingston. Gladstone was driven by a sense of high moral purpose and a heavy burden of guilt, in part because his own family had once made a fortune from slave labor. As the leader of the Liberal Party, Gladstone campaigned for the export of civilized values through commerce, not conquest. Gladstone feels that the empire is there, there's not much you can do about it. He doesn't want to add to it, and he believes that imperialism is a creed which can contaminate the British people, uh, make them warlike, aggressive, um, whereas he thinks of a world in which there is universal peace. When he looks at imperialism, he says, is this godly? And he decides it isn't. He sees it as might somehow triumphing over right. And he's rather frightened if the British people get in trance with empire. They'll go gallivanting off, fighting wars here, there and everywhere, will spend a lot of money and cease to be a moral force in the world. This view was fiercely contested by his great rival, Benjamin Disraeli. Disraeli first moved into the Prime Minister's office in 1867, and for the next 15 years, he and Gladstone would alternate in power. Disraeli believed in the expansion of the British Empire. He liked to claim that his ancestors had been rich Venetian merchants trading with the Orient, and this gave him a romantic enthusiasm for imperial adventures. Disraeli viewed the empire as an extraordinary asset. The empire made Britain a great power, a global power, and also enabled it to have plenty of muscle in Europe. And Disraeli, of course, likes the glamour of empire. He sees it uh, as bestowing prestige on the country. He eventually hopes that the white colonies will not follow the American course, but remain emotionally tied to Britain, particularly through the person of the crown. But Victoria was still in deep mourning. Since the death of Prince Albert, she had lost interest in the empire and all other affairs of state. Victoria went into what I called Perda, I think because she felt incompetent to handle being a queen. Albert had done the work for her so long. Albert had done everything, thought out everything for her, arranged everything for her, that she did not feel she was up to it again. The Queen found some consolation with the Scotsman John Brown. She began writing about him a few months after Albert's death. I have an invaluable Highland servant who is my factotum here and takes the most wonderful care of me. 
combining the offices of groom, footman, page, and maid, I might almost say, as he is so handy about cloaks and shawls. He always leads my pony and always attends me out of doors. I think she also enjoyed his uh, picking her up in his arms uh, and uh, putting her on her horse and taking her off her horse again. For the first time since Albert, she had a strong, brawny man uh, who uh, held her in his arms. And I think that's as far as the sexuality really went, but she enjoyed it. To the dismay of her family and government, the queen and her highland servant became inseparable. A section of press and public called her Mrs. Brown, and her absence from public duty was widely condemned. There were cartoons in the newspapers about this, with showing an empty throne. Uh, there were uh, editorials in the newspapers about it. Why are we paying so much money uh, to maintain a royal family? Uh, because the royal family is the symbol uh, of the empire and of uh, Britain, and here we don't have one. It was Disraeli who would rekindle the Queen's interest in public affairs. His relationship with Victoria had begun badly. She saw him as an upstart, an opportunist, what the British call a chancer. But Disraeli, with his considerable charm, set out to win her. His official dispatches to her were spiced with social gossip and witty anecdotes. Part of Disraeli's job as Prime Minister was to write an account of um, what was happening in Parliament and what was going on in the Cabinet to the Queen. And Disraeli's letters to the Queen were wonderfully detailed and rather gossipy and actually rather indiscreet. Um, he probably told the Queen far more than he ought to have done, particularly about divisions of opinion. Um, most people, made uh, Prime Ministers, made these letters very brief and rather official. But Disraeli's letters to Victoria uh, were full of sort of protestations of affection and um, love and loyalty. They were largely sugar. But Queen Victoria lapped it up. And for once, the Queen was amused. She wrote to her eldest daughter, Vicky. Mr. Disraeli's reports are just like his novels, highly colored. She'd never had such letters in her life, she declared, and had never before known everything. Her attitude to the upstart underwent a dramatic change. Mr. Disraeli has achieved his present high position entirely by his ability, his wonderful, happy disposition, and I have nothing but praise for him. She sent him primroses that she picked herself. In return, Disraeli gave her a set of his novels. Victoria had just published a book of her own, a reminiscence of her days with Prince Albert at their palace in Scotland. Disraeli was awfully good at just saying the tactful remark uh, that Queen Victoria would enjoy. For example, uh, one of the best was Disraeli saying to her, we authors, ma'am, which was precisely what Victoria longed to hear, that they were both part of the same club of writers. Disraeli bewitched the Queen with his romantic vision of the British Empire. It would have horrified Prince Albert. In the future, Victoria and Disraeli would form a powerful alliance for the imperial cause. But it would be some time before their partnership would bear fruit. Disraeli's first term as prime minister lasted less than a year. When he was voted out of office, the queen had to send for the leader of the liberals, Gladstone. Victoria began by liking Gladstone. He seemed to be an upright man. Uh, he was ambitious, but he was also extremely smart. Prince Albert had warmly approved of Gladstone. 
When the new prime minister came to the palace to receive the seals of office, the queen recorded her approval. He is very agreeable, so quiet and intellectual, with such a knowledge of all subjects, and is such a good man. But her satisfaction did not last. Gladstone embarked on a whirlwind of liberal reforms that revived conservative instincts in the Queen that had been dormant while Albert was alive. Mr. Gladstone is a very dangerous man, and so very arrogant, tyrannical and obstinate, with no knowledge of the world or human nature. All this, and much want of regard towards my feelings, make him a very dangerous and unsatisfactory premier. She was not amused when he proposed that sailors might be permitted to grow beards, and she was horrified by moves towards female equality. The Queen draws Mr. Gladstone's attention to the mad and utterly demoralizing movement of the present day to place women in the same position as men. But it was Gladstone's private life that caused Victoria the most concern. Because of his fanatical religion, he felt everybody had to be converted to his ways of morality and ethics. He would go out in the streets at night, even when he was prime minister, uh, and solicit prostitutes, uh, take them back to their rooms, give them Bibles. Uh, he would give them money and he would ask them to uh, tread the straight and narrow ways. Victoria got to know this because her maids in waiting told her everything and it repelled her. At one point, when Gladstone was to go up to visit Victoria at Balmoral, she sent him a letter telling him that when he arrived, it was to be with a new suit of clothes that he had never worn before. It was very clear that she wanted nothing of the degrading uh, atmosphere of his involvement with these uh, ladies of the evening. Gladstone was unconcerned by the Queen's personal disapproval of him, but he was appalled by the imperialist ideas she had picked up from Disraeli. His own more liberal views of Britain's role were confidently being put to the test in Africa. David Livingston had returned to his dark continent. This time he had been sent on an official mission to find a trading route into the interior and to achieve his dream of combining commerce, civilization, and the Christian religion. To this end, he was provided with generous funds by the British government and accompanied by six British scientists and his wife, Mary, herself a devoted missionary. Livingston believed that the Zambezi River could become a great highway for British industrial goods. But as they voyaged along the river, the expedition ran into dangerous rapids. He believed that the Zambezi could be a trade route, this great river, which he'd seen at Victoria Falls. But when he traveled down it, he missed out one or two sections. He took shortcuts. Well, that was a very reasonable thing to do. It saved a lot of time. But these shortcuts were quite impassable. And that's what the uh, Zambezi expedition found, that his hope of this being a great highway into the center of Africa wasn't there. Livingston refused to admit defeat. He kept up the search for a trading route. But then the expedition confronted another and more frightening peril. Despite repeated attacks of malaria, Livingston had dismissed the danger of disease. I apprehend no great mortality among missionaries, men of education and prudence who can, if they will, adopt proper hygienic precautions. But this optimism was to lead to tragedy. Mary Livingston was one of the first to go down with a fever. 
On the 29th of April, 1862, Livingston wrote to his mother, My beloved partner, whom I loved and treasured so much for 18 years, is with Jesus. She was a good wife, a good mother, and a good Christian. <laughs> 